Hello everyone, today is Thursday, March 14, 2019. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and gals for being here today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule, and I am flattered by your presence. All right, what are we talk about? Well, first, obviously, as usual, we're going to talk about current market conditions and your questions on trading your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, keep your questions to the slides until we get to the markets, just to make sure my ADD doesn't kick in too bad. And then when we ask about stocks, if, when you ask about stocks, wait until we get into the live charts, and then for your benefit, just ask about one stock at a time. So this week's focus is going to be unhappy index. And I think that this is probably fodder for a lot more research and a lot more discussions. And that'll all make sense in just one minute. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That comes from my buddy, Greg Morris. So let's talk about unhappy endings. Dealing with the fact that all trades end badly. Now, recently, I was in the process of moving, and the people who bought our house ended up closing about three weeks earlier than expected. My wife's like, oh, that takes a long time. Once you get the offer and blah, blah, blah. Well, it turns out they really wanted a house, and they made things happen really quickly. So we had to scramble to get out, and I had 30 years worth of hobbies up in the attic. And this is only part, this is like cleaned up part of what's left. Windsurfers, uh, rockets from that phase, a car I've been restoring for just about 12 years, only 12 years, and a lot more junk stuff from boats that I've had in the past and just tons and tons and tons of stuff. So we we're in a tremendous amount of stress. And on top of that, my new office, which I'm trying to get used to, I sneezed earlier and I hit my head twice <laughs> on the walls twice. I was in a thousand square foot office, an entire small little guest house, and now I'm in a hundred square foot office. I'm also in the same house as my wife is now, and she works from home. She goes out on calls, but she spends a lot of time at home. And the new house that we're building, we're in a rental now, but the new house we're building, I'm going to insulate the walls and I have a separate office where I have to literally walk out of my house and walk into my office. And I think I think that's important for a lot of reasons, but without digressing too far, I'm going to have the walls insulated with some rock saw so I can say what I want and do what I want in there. And actually, my reactions lately have been somewhat muted because I don't want to completely freak out my wife. So maybe I do have a little bit of pent-up anger <laughs> from not releasing it. But the question is, does Big Dave need a dose of Big Dave? My wife is like, Dave, don't you tell your clients to not trade around major life events? And I'm kind of growling, Ur. I don't know. Usually when I imitate her, it's, it's more of like a Marge Simpson. It's more like, Dave! <laughs> Don't you don't you tell your clients not to trade during a major life events? Well, of course, I was doing a little Terminator thing in my head, you know, yes, dear, no, dear. Tried to explain it to her a little bit, and then that ended up coming like coming out like at least her reply in her mind was like, oh, I'm not smart enough to understand what you're doing. And the thing was that in hindsight, I was actually doing pretty good, and what was happening was completely normal. And I explained to her that I may have, well, I don't know if I explained this to her, but I may have taken a trade or two that I shouldn't have. But most of my frustration and aggravation was watching some really big profits begin to evaporate. And in doing the column that I did recently and putting together this presentation, I went back and looked at the trades and I saw that six out of seven trades had hit the initial profit target. Now, trust me, it's not always this good. And if it was, you probably would never see my fat ass again. So 
Six out of seven ain't too bad. It's kind of funny. As I was putting this, together this presentation, I was thinking about the ain't too bad thing. <laughs> I, I sold my brewery when uh, moving, and luckily that, that went really quick. I thought it would take a while to sell a brewery. I was surprised how many people want to buy a brewery. And uh, it was a pretty massive brewery, I mean, at least for a, for a garage at least. Took up about half the garage, 20 gallons or whatever. And um, tons and tons of money invested in all this equipment. And I remember the first time I brought some over to a buddy's house and one of his neighbors showed up and he goes, could I have one? I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, and he has, he takes a sip and he goes, he goes, well, it ain't too bad. And I'm thinking that ain't too bad. Beer is probably about $6 a glass that you're drinking. So somebody's not, doesn't have audio. Turn, turn your speakers up louder. Turn your speakers up. Oh, they left. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I guess we could talk about them. So anyway, so I was actually doing quite well, and it just comes with the territory, and it's something that you'll you'll have to get over in the end, which we'll talk about. Now, without digressing too far, what I've kind of hinted at here is your life will spill over into your trading, and your trading will spill over into your life. Now, it's kind of interesting. My, my phone just texted. Uh, I guess you could might have heard it. I have to check that in just a second. My daughter, like right as I'm about to go live here, rips her bumper off her car. It's like it's like everybody's out to get me. I go to these presentations and, and something happens to ice the kicker. Well, that's another example of your life will spill over to your trading. Your trading will spill into, over to your life. This morning, I'm having a bit of a drawdown, and in one position, it actually opened loss, which had been profitable, and now it's turned turned red on me. And so that's got me a little bit aggravated. And then, of course, I'm aggravated with the situation that my daughter was careless and decides to rip her bumper off. And my wife is angry at me because I didn't text her back within one minute of receiving the text. So... Again, your life will spill over into your trading, and your trading will spill over into your life. Give me one second to deal with life. Now, before I digress too far, I named this presentation, Why All Trend Trades in Badly. And I put trend in there because we are trend traders, and I want to keep it within the methodology but you have to remember, and I know it's it's kind of a duh, but the only way to profit from a trade on any trade is to capture a trend. You have to sell higher than you buy. Now, notice I didn't say buy low and sell high. That's a loser's game. And one reason I'm not a reversion to the mean trader is you're basically fighting the trend, but you're hoping that that trend reverses. So even if you're trading reversion to the mean, a new trend better show up soon. So all trades eventually end badly. One of three things are going to happen when you get into a trade. First of all, and again, as I preach, I'd probably make a lot more money in my educational business if I got on YouTube and made trading sound a lot more exciting and posted P&Ls on my good days and bragged about everything, stood on a tarmac in front of a rented jet. You ever notice those jets never fly anywhere? They never get off the jet. <laughs> they have a picture of them sitting on a jet. Anyway, I'm not, I don't want to digress too far. But obviously, you'll flat out lose, possibly, or with my hybrid approach to money management, you'll make a little bit, you'll make that swing trade, and then you'll get stopped out for a scratch or maybe a little bit of money on the remainder of the trade, depending on how everything trails out, or the third thing will happen is you'll capture a longer-term trend and in the end give up a piece of that at the end of the trade. Now, in this presentation, we're going to focus mostly on what happens at the end of the trade, but I do want to highlight some things that happen somewhere in between. If you are a good little trend follower, and by the way, the only way to make any real money in the market is to capture a longer term trend. So we do take this hybrid approach to money management where we're taking partial profits along the way just once. We're taking that half off 
at one for one initial risk. Go in and watch the money management module under the learning management system for more net in the members area. But what happens is if we're good little trend followers and we're trailing our stop higher, and hopefully, I know I just said hope, but hopefully we get to ride out corrections one after another after another. Now, as I often say, I'm slotted as a swing trader, but I'll stick with a position as long as it moves in my favor. My last position I put on back in October, and that stopped out a week or two ago. So let's see, November, December, January, February, February, December, October, November. It's about four months or so. So that's a decent trade. And that's a decent time to hold on to a trade. Now, but ideally, I like to hold on for years. In the end, though, what appears at least initially to be just a correction can turn into a bona fide reversal. And that's when we get stopped out. Now, as I've said recently, I've had situations where we've been in a trade and I looked at it and I looked at how much money was given up. And there's more of that life spilling into my trading. <laughs> But I recently looked at a trade that we were long for a couple of years, and in the end, it's like, ouch, that really hurt. And then I saw that same particular stock a couple of years later. It's like, my goodness, if we could have held on through that correction, which at the time appeared to be much more than correction, we'd be up much, much, much more. So you never know whether that correction is going to turn into a bona fide reversal or not. Now... Since I had a positive net net, why was I upset? Well, as you know, I read a lot of these behavioral science type of books. And for a while, I quit reading them because they all kind of sound the same. And now I started to read them again. And sometimes it's okay to hear things again. Sometimes you hear things in a different way. And one of my other beefs is that they all tend to draw upon Thinking Fast and Slow by Kannerman and I think uh, Tversky. Did a lot of research with him on that. The Undoing Project is a good book to read about those two guys, by the way. It's all under books to read. But anyway, like I said, they all tend to sound the same. But it's starting to sink in with me on some of these things. And, and each one I read, even though I'm not getting a whole lot out of them anymore, I still am getting a piece. And it still reminds me of things. And like this latest one that I read, which I'll talk about in one second, Dollars and Cents, it made me think about this unhappy Endings thing, endings thing. And they repeated the research of Kannerman and some others. And it's kind of a gross example, but it really drives the point home. The end of a trade, like a colonoscopy, is a pain in the arse. Well, the research that Kannerman and some others did, or Kannerman referenced, and so and now hourly references is that when people get a colonoscopy, my wife just came home, that's why I had to close the door. So it's having to adjust and not having a separate office. So here I am talking about colonoscopy. She's probably wondering what the hell's going on in there. <laughs> There's a lot of what the hell's going on in here you're gonna learn about anyway. But what they did was, obviously you want that experience to be as short as possible. I'm getting up there in age and my wife saw me to go get one, but I digress. Anyway, you obviously want that to be as short as possible. What they found, though, was if at the end, and this is where it gets kind of gross, instead of going and you're done, they tend to slowly end things, and it's not quite as bad, but the whole situation lasts a lot longer as opposed to rip it off like a Band-Aid, let's be through with this. Well, what they found was those people who had the longer experience and it ended a little bit better with less pain, tended to see the whole colonoscopy is not that bad. One example that Arley talks about in this book is vacations. And it reminded me of my experience with my first and possibly last cruise. My wife and I went on a cruise, and I guess in hindsight it was pretty good, but while we were experiencing it, it was like, oh, okay, it's a little rough, but it's not too bad. And she got a little seasick too, one day, but not too bad. And we met some people, and they were pretty cool, and we hung out with them. And, you know, we parted like rock stars the whole time. And we went off in Mexico and had a little fun. And at the end of our trip, we get our drinking bill. Everything else was all inclusive. And we're like, hey, you know, the food's not too bad. The food ain't too bad. And everything's, yeah, it's okay. But we got our big drinking bill, and it's like, holy moly. <laughs> We had a little bit more fun than 
we realized. And so that kind of got us to thinking, well, you know, it was kind of rough and you did get kind of seasick. And really that food, even though it was all you could eat, really wasn't that good. And the Mexico experience, well, it was fun, but we ended up in two different cars. The women were in one car, the men were in another. So that could have ended badly. You know, I don't know. It really wasn't that great. And I think that the end of the vacation, getting that bill, the pain of the end is what sticks with you. And that's kind of like the whole genesis of me focusing on this end of the trade thing, especially since I've recently lived through it. Now, without digressing too far, this morning I plugged in the net net cumulative price change of an open trade and I picked a volatile stock, not that I don't, not that most of my stocks aren't volatile, but I picked a volatile stock. And as you can see, if you were to draw a line from where the trade started, where on the first day it was slightly in the negative column, and then you added up the cumulative price change, you can see it started off here, first day was negative, and then every day else was net positive. And if you connect the dots, you can see that, okay, up around four points now but at one point it was up like seven points and five points but net net still kind of hanging in there hasn't done anything really wrong with a longer term trend following position now i took the behavioral psychologist research from many people it's dorn has said this Arley has said this kahneman you know all these guys uh tversky thaler they all tend to like i said say the same thing and again, as I often preach, the, the positive up here of a positive movement is one times, okay? It makes you feel pretty good. But the negative emotion is twice that of the positive. And without digressing too far, this is why gamblers get into so much trouble is once they go into drawdown, they're chasing that high. and it takes more and more and more to make up for the emotional impact. So what I did here was if it went up one point, then I, on this emotional scale, I went up one point. However, if it went down one point on this emotional scale, I would plug it in as two points. Okay. This, this is probably a better example here. So, as you lose money, this tends to just get further and further and further in the hole. So it becomes a net negative. And that's just one thing that I've been wrapping my head around or trying to wrap my head around lately is the net negatives of trading. And I've been a little worried that I'm a little too focused lately on the net negatives. But number one, that's reality. And number two, the more that we begin to understand this reality, the more we can embrace and accept it. And if you go in and look at some of the more recent presentations that I've done, I've, been talk, I've talked a lot about peeling that trading psychology onion. And if you can learn to embrace the fact that from a neurology type of level, we have these things going on in our head, not to mention all the psychology that's happening, then your life gets a little bit easier. What's it was Keatering, I think, I can't think of his, I don't know if I'm saying his name right or not, I have to look at the slides. But he once said that a problem well stated is a problem half solved. And I do believe that to be true. The more we understand what's going on in that thing that's sloshing around in our head, the better off we are. Now, Richard Dennis of the Turtles fame, according to Curtis Faith, and Curtis Faith wrote a book, Trading from the Gut, which is pretty good. And the Turtles book was was pretty good, too. I, I swore, as I've said before, I would never read these Turtles book. And I met with Larry McMillan once. And he said, no, the Turtle book, uh, the way the Turtle is pretty good. He talked about the ping pong table in the back of the office. And maybe if I ever get a big enough office again, I'll put, my, put me a ping pong table in there. I don't know who I'd play with. But the reason was that they had something to do when there was nothing to do, which I thought was quite brilliant, and they actually became pretty good ping pong players in the process. Now, anyway, Curtis Face said that Dennis treated drawdowns to open profits quite differently. 
And his point was that he really didn't worry too much about the Turtles if they were losing open profits. He had a big problem, though, when they had open losses. And then he would look at that a lot more carefully. But losses to open profits is perfectly normal. And if you're going to be a trend follower, you just sort of have to live with that. And it reminds me of a story. Mike Moody was talking at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting, probably the same meeting that McMillan recommended The Way of the Turtle. And by the way, you can get all these on books to read on my website, davelander.com slash books dash to dash read. And I'll make probably 30 cents if you buy a book, but I'll put it in the plate or pump it back into the website. Anyway, Mike Moody was giving a presentation on relative strength. And my experience with relative strength is it ends badly. And I got whacked recently, like I just said, and that's where a lot of this, this talk is coming from. And I remember going years back, right around the time that, that Mike Moody was talking, where I was tracking a list called the Landry 100. Nothing ever really came of the list. It was a wonderful exercise. It was a lot of work, though, and I decided to, to suspend that just because it was taking up so much time. But it was a very worthwhile exercise, and basically what I was doing was putting any momentum stock as it made a significant new high, usually a 52-week high, but some of them a little bit less, into the list, especially if it's making a high on expansion range. And I would take out stocks that were underperforming. And if I had a lot of new stocks that were worth going in, I would put those in a portfolio and let it bump out some of the ones towards the bottom. And through this exercise and tracking the day-over-day -day price change, I happened to notice that right before the market sold off hard, it got whacked pretty hard. So that momentum got hit the hardest first. And I've also noticed that in my own portfolio, especially since doing that research for several years. And Mike Moody, again, was giving this presentation about the strength and momentum. And I raised my hand. I said, Mike, I, I've done a lot of research here. I'm a momentum guy. I'm a trader. And one thing that I've found is it ends badly. And is there anything you could do about that? And Mike's kind of a, he's an ex-college basketball player. He's probably six, seven, you know, but very kind of a gentle giant type of guy, soft-spoken. And he's like, Dave, if you're going to have a baby, you're going to have a lot of baby poop. Now, babies are really cool and they're neat, but you're going to have a lot of baby poop. So it comes with the territory. Now, this is what we signed up for, this trend following with this hybrid money management approach. And when it pays off, it really pays off. And again, the only way you're ever going to make any real money is to capture a longer term trend. So if you want to end up wearing gold plated diapers, baby, you have to be willing to give up some of those profits in the end. And who was it, Churchill? Definition of success is going from one failure to another without any loss of enthusiasm. Well, in this, it's like it's not necessarily a failure by giving up those open profits, but you have to be willing to say, okay, well, I'm done with that. I'm done with that trade. And then you just have to shout next and get over it. I know, easier said than done. So what I'm alluding to here is ways to deal with those unhappy endings. Well, the easiest thing for you to do is to plan your trade and trade your plan. My work is done. I'm going to drop the mic. Peace out, bitches. Oh, crap. I think I just broke my mic. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. Well, hopefully I made the point. Yeah, it's cliche, and it's easier said than done. But ultimately, that is our goal, and that's what we have to do. Now, you have to learn to be happy with a net net. If you look at the trade, and let's say you got in at 10, let's say it ran at 20, and it drew down to 15, so overall, you made five points on the trade. Well, without that trade, you wouldn't have made those five points. So you have to look at the net net and be happy with the net net. You know, like I often say, I've had clients where we're in these great momentum trades and in the end they get whacked and they email me and they bitch about the money they gave up. And I always tell them, look, take enough money out to go get a massage. And in doing research for this, I went and got a massage yesterday. I had a first time I had a, had a male guy 
court called me. I was uh, a little worried like a stanza that it might move. But anyway, I digress. Take out enough money to go get a massage and then send the rest of the money to me. And my P.O. box is 298. And that's in Abita Springs, Louisiana, 70420, Cintiff Trading, LLC, care of Dave Landry. And in 20-something years of public commentary, not one person has sent me a check from those troublesome profits. But, you know, go get your massage and forget about forget about those profits because you mailed them away and get over it. But the bottom line there is, all kidding aside, is you just have to get over it, and that's what we signed up for, and that's what happens. Now, one way to kind of mitigate things is to take partial profits along the way. As I've said quite a bit, when we have several trades in a row where it hits the initial profit target, stops out, hits the initial profit target, stops out, Several times in a row, people are like, well, why don't we take 100% here? Well, other times when the stock just keeps on going, people are like, well, why in the heck do we take these partial profits? Well, we take these partial profits because more often than not, that's all we get on a trade. Well, why not just play for 100% here? Well, because you're never going to get this big winner, and this is where the real money is, and it only takes one or two. Now, I know I'll probably make it sound a little too elusive, and sometimes it sure feels that way. But all you need is one or two of these to make you year. And we just kind of chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it until this happens. And sometimes we get lucky, like I just said, six out of seven, which is pretty good. But I'd much rather have one or two big winners and not worry so much about all the other trades and how they're doing. I wouldn't mind losing on six trades if that one big trade was five times as much. I mean, the ultimate goal is to make money. But what happens in the meantime can be kind of hard to live with. Now, one thing I would suggest you not do is hedge. And Yogi Berra once said, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. I know some other people have said that too, but I'll give Yogi credit. So one thing that I wanted to illustrate with the hedging is that hedging really sounds good on paper, but reality is it comes with a cost. So let's say that you have to spend this much to establish the hedge and the market starts going up. Well, your hedge is going to start losing money, okay? The market goes down, well, the hedge is start making money. Now, you're only hedged to a certain level. So if you the market makes goes up and this goes down, the market goes up and this goes up, you're only going to make back to where your hedge is. And when you reach a point way out here, you have a decision. You need to reset your hedge to up here. Do you do that or not? And the other thing, the point I'm trying to illustrate here is if your position is going up, you're making money. But guess what? Your hedge is losing money. Now, without digging myself a huge hole, hedging gets really complicated really fast. If you are possibly doing some sort of complex option strategy, then maybe a hedge could work for you. Larry McMillan, as I was talking about Larry earlier, he has a fund where I think after 6%, the hedge begins to kick in. But if the market only drops 5.5%, the hedge doesn't work. And it's actually a drain on the portfolio. So and if it's a complex option strategy, then yeah, maybe hedging might work. But as a general statement, hedging is a drain on your portfolio longer term. I think you're much better off going for outright moves and just dealing with the bad ending and furthermore, taking some partial profits along the way to help mitigate that bad ending. Now, again, with these behavioral science books, it's like they all sound the same, but my litmus test for a decent book is if I pick up one or two useful thoughts, then the book has more than paid for itself. And I often called it mentally monetizing, and I didn't realize that Thayer, I think that's his name, had called it mentally accounting for money. Well, by mentally monetizing, and I'm sure Mr. Thayer would agree, what I'm saying is you're looking at those profits and saying, well, I could pay off a credit card or some sort of payment, or I could pay a month's rent or a mortgage or whatever the case may be, or maybe even do something more fun like go on a cruise, <laughs> which isn't that much fun. And in the dollars and cents book, Hourly also called mentally monetizing as emotional accounting. And I think that makes a lot of sense for us traders is we do tend to 
not only monetize or emotionally account for that money. So if you think about it, if you minimally monetize something at $2,000 and then that stock begins to come back in, you tend to think about the money you lost, the painful ending, as opposed to the money you made because you no longer can pay off that credit card fully or pay off or that mortgage, whatever, pay that monthly mortgage or monthly rent. So there's an emotional aspect to that. So emotional accounting, I think, is a really good way of putting it. Now, if you must account emotionally, what I often say is account to the stop. And here's a trade we put on recently, and this is one of the more volatile ones. We had a buy point. We had initial profit target, which was hit. And now we have a protective stop. Now, a few days ago or about a week ago, the thing just kind of blasted higher. It looked like it was going to the moon. I'm like, yay, I'm going to tell my friends. I mean, I, I admittedly, I got pretty excited about it. And I looked at my P&L on that day, of course. But the reality is if you're going to mentally monetize or emotionally account for that money, then monetize it up into the stop. Now, that's a pretty big swing, but that's what it calls for. And we're not trying to get $2,000 out of this trade. We're trying to get $20,000 or more, hopefully much more. So early in a trade like this, even though it seems like a big swing, especially percentage-wise, it's what comes with the territory. But remember, we have already taken off $1,000 per 100K on this position, and this is what it looks like now. So barring overnight gaps, of course, if you got stopped on this trade where it is now, then you make $500. Now, it's I know it's not easy to, to do that, and I am guilty of all these behaviors as anyone, and I think that's why I spend so much time on psychology is because I am also trying to work through the same exact issues. As the great Bill Clinton once said, I feel your pain. Now, the other thing to think about is, can you just trade like Ron? Ron Papil had the Showtime Rotisserie 2000 chicken grill cooker thing, and his slogan was, set it. And then the people in infomercial would say, and forget it. So can you do that with trades? Well, to some extent you can. In more recent times, especially since I've been in and out of the office, moving, I stand here until the open. I didn't say stand because my trading desk forces me to stand up. I refuse to sit down and do trades because I think I can get lazy and end up watching that screen all day. So I have to stand up, and after about 30 minutes staring at the screen, I kind of get a little tired of standing, and it reminds me not to sit there and stand. Sit there and stand? Stand there and sit? Anyway, <laughs> stand there and watch the screen. So what I've been doing in more recent times is if the stops a ways away and there's no damage control or discretionary type of situation on the open, I'll let the stock open and then put my stops in and then go about my life. And in more recent times, I was go to the other house, load up me or make a load or whatever and coordinate all this moving stuff. So to some extent, you can in some cases, and I don't want to get too far into the money management, but... In some cases, you can put a limit order in, and that's I'm not a huge fan of limit orders, but for taking partial profit sometime, especially if it's a kind of a volatile stock, and after the open, you see it's not going to be a huge big day up, but you know you're getting fairly close to that initial profit target, you can put in a limit order, and I call that a pay me type of order in case that market spikes up. And not, off, not all the time and not often, but sometimes the market will spike up, you'll get that initial profit target and the market will come right back in. And that's perfectly okay. So put in a hard stop in some particular cases if the stock is fairly far away. If you're very disciplined and have good access to your phone, then possibly put in some alerts to alert you to take action when it hits a certain level. But you have to be somewhat of a robot when that happens and make sure you get out of that trade and don't make too many additional decisions. And in some cases, again, it's just easier to put in a hard stop and then go about your life. All right, let's pop out to the overall market. Got a quiet bunch today. Any questions on anything so far? Comments, complaints, amusing anecdotes, anecdotes. All right, let's, um, let me get my application shared. 
All right, let's take a look at the overall market first, and then we can take a look at a few sectors. And then, of course, we'll take a look at your individual stock picks. But feel free to begin asking about any stocks that you might want to talk about. If you want to learn more about the market timing, what I would recommend you do, and then you can follow along with a lot of things that I'm saying here, is take the free market timing course on my website. It's still there, even though I haven't been advertising as much lately. But if you go to the members on the homepage, once you sign up for the free membership, it's there. Okay, let's talk about the P's first. Kind of Flatsville today, a little bit on the overbought side already. They swung from very oversold to very overbought, I'm sorry, to a little oversold, back to overbought. And they're right at these recent little peaks in here. Now, as I've been saying at nausea, I'm sick of myself saying it, or sick of hearing myself say it, I should say. On a weekly basis, it still looks like a big picture retrace. And let me show you what I mean by that. Let's see if we can do. So if you take a look at a weekly and you draw this leg down and you draw this leg up, so far, especially longer term, it just looks like a big picture retrace rally. Now, if we get past these recent peaks in here, circa 2800 decisively, then all bets are off. Then we might have a bona fide rally underway. Now, one thing I often say is, when in doubt, take the chart out. So draw your lines and then remove the actual price data. And you can see that, albeit kind of a deep pullback, but you got a thrust followed by a pullback. So that's something, it's a pretty good exercise if I say so myself, doing that. Now, here's the deal too. If we go to the all time highs or thereabout, we're only about 4% away, so that's certainly a good thing. Now, as some of you pointed out, and I didn't realize it until you did, because I was, I did, I thought it would take a few more weeks to trigger. But if we go to a weekly chart, back to weekly, I should say, and we take a look at the fact that we had two lows greater than the 50 week moving average in other words there's land in other words there's landry light then the tfm 10 percent system would trigger a buy because we're less than 10 percent away from all-time highs now these type of signals as i often say i don't follow mechanically but i do find them quite interesting that they can get you or keep you i should say out of a lot of trouble just buy something like a daily bow tie, a weekly bow tie, or even the TFM 10% system. And all that's under the market timing module I talked about. And that's free. And I gave it away for free because I thought we were in a lot of trouble in the market. And we might still be, but so far, market's kind of hanging in there. So let's take a look at the NASDAQ. And if we back the chart out a little bit, you can see we're just on the cusp of taking out these final little peaks in here. And like the P's, if we take a measurement from those all-time closing highs that happened way back in September, we're eh, less than 10% away, we're just about 6% away from all-time highs. So the market, as I said earlier, or as I was saying earlier, ain't too bad. One big concern, though, obviously, same thing here as the P's, is that we are very oversold and people like well how do you gauge oversold it's like well 21 percent run in three months that's a pretty big run so longer term we're pretty oversold shorter term from here to here we're uh pretty oversold from here to here let's try that again so we're pretty oversold shorter term too now for the aggressive if you come in or we come in and the market gaps open like way up here or something and then begins to sell off an opening gap reversal type of play might be a pretty cool trade to put on but i would be careful and not try to force things to happen with that unless you really do see the mother of all opening gap reversals i did i talked about that a little bit in yesterday's q a which is under the members area let's take a look at the rusty the rusty is lagging a bit over the short to intermediate term, it looks okay. You had a pretty good thrust. You had a nice little pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, rinse and repeat, right? Well, bigger picture, same sort of action as the S&P 500 and NASDAQ. 
you have this big picture retracement so far. So these recent peaks in here, let's just say 160 round numbers, become an inflection point. And also, speaking of inflection points, take a look at the pullbacks in the S&P, the NASDAQ, and of course the Russell. And I think that little pivot there and this little pivot up here, or and then maybe with today's data, even better. But let's just go with this pivot here. We have some inflection points to work around. So if we can get past these recent highs decisively, then we may have dodged a bullet. As I've also been saying a lot recently, I think everybody who held through this ugly, ugly slide, first of all, I think they're not the smartest people in the world, but we'll stay away from that right now. That's a 23% slide in the NASDAQ. And what's in the P's? Let's just do that real quick. That's going to be pretty ugly there, too. And in the P's, right around its worst. Let's see if we can find a day. Yeah, it's about 20%. Okay. So the media defines a bear market as 20%. That's kind of a relative, irrelative, irrelevant. I'm trying to make two words out of one. So like Jesse Jackson making up words. But it is concerning that that's such a dip that I don't think anyone should hold through such a significant dip in the overall market. And there were weekly signals that were beginning to trend. In fact, as I say, even though you have, even though the market's recovered quite a bit, you still have to pay attention to the fact that we are under some weekly sell signals. And this market isn't out of the woods just yet, but as a day-by-day -day guy, it's, it's improving as of late, and I've gotten long quite a few stocks. I've gotten stopped out of a few along the way. And if I continue to see buy-side setups, I'm going to continue to play the buy-side setups. If I start seeing a bunch of shorts, then I'll start shorting. I'll let the database tell me what to do. Right now, I don't see any reason to rush out and do a lot of shorting. Why? Well, the market's going up and the database is not producing a lot of shorts. Let's take a look at a couple sectors real quick. A lot of the sectors look like the overall market. Some areas like finance have been, the financials have been doing okay. They still have some overhead supply to deal with. Energies have been doing pretty good as of late, at least more recently. Let's take a look at the dollar. The dollar can help, as you know, with these commodity-related stocks because the commodities are dollar-denominated. And if the dollar weakens, then those it's going to take more dollars to buy those energy stocks and commodity stocks and metals and mining and so on and so on and so forth. So that could be a little bit of what we're seeing there. Notice the dollar is strong today. Metals are down. It's not always a one-to-one -one correlation, and it's not always perfectly inversely correlated. So you got to be really careful with the inner market technical analysis. But it's worth understanding. Banks have a little overhead supply to get through, like a lot of other areas. But most areas sort of look like the overall market itself. But I'd feel a lot better if they would make it back all the way to new highs. Let's take a look at the semis real quick. The semis have been doing a pretty good job of pushing through this overhead supply. They're a little wide and loose, though, but I'd feel pretty good, again, if they made it to new highs. So in general, sectors looking pretty good. Some sectors like, is it utilities? Utilities at new highs and REITs are at new highs. Maybe that's because bonds have it come unglued as of late, like everybody thought they would. Really not a whole lot to gleam in bonds, kind of all over the place. All right, let's look at some of your stock picks. CVIA, keep them coming. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. Uh, what I like here, this is a, a die and possibly a Phoenix type of strategy setting up. So this is why, again, go in and look at the presentation from the last two weeks, or even better, get the IPO course. And as I preach quite often, these things come public and just absolutely die. Somebody screws up when they open it up this high. They're not leaving any meat on the bone for anyone, and then they die out. But sometimes these companies do get their act together and over time can bottom out and be worthwhile. Now, this isn't a setup just yet. What I would do here is wait to see if it continues to bottom out and then sets up. Maybe you'll get like a, I don't know if it'll turn into a bow tie, but maybe a bow tie type of pattern. And that's okay when they 
when you have a bow tie and they come down and make kind of a double bottom. I think I want to say C and X did that a while back. I know some of our bigger winners in the past have gone down and make that Phoenix type of strategy, double bow tie. Let's see, when was that? Was that then? You know, like maybe way back here. Was that 2016? I forget when. But when you have these major, major all-time lows, then it's worth taking a, sh taking a look at something like um, bow tie. In this particular case, you're coming off of all-time lows. So maybe some transitional pattern along the way. Maybe let it break out and look for a pullback. But right now, you're a little too early on that one. IQ. This one looks okay. Uh, this is another relatively new issue. And sometimes, as I say, they they fly, they die, and then they fly again. And maybe that's where we are now. It's not jumping out at me at this juncture, but it looks okay. And then now you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Like you have like three weeks of kind of sideways trading in here. I like to see also a little bit more knockout move. So I would put that on your momentum list, but I don't see it as being set up at this juncture. VNTR. This one looks okay. This one has been catching my eye here and there. It now has a few too many days in the pullback. It just kind of keeps drifting lower, drifting lower. Maybe on a two-day chart or something. Let's take a look at a bow tie. So it looked pretty good for a while here. I like the way it bottomed out and was kind of sloppy initially, but then it got its act together. I guess you could technically count that as a bow tie off of major lows, even though it didn't happen back here where it should have. But just too many days in the pullback. So I think I would pass on, on that one. Any more? A quiet bunch today. I know I did a poor job of promoting the show today, so my apologies on that. Every week I say I'm going to get around to promoting it better, but life gets in the way. <laughs> I also get busy working on slides. Let's take a look at gold while we're waiting on setups. Gold, the commodity, you can see began to implode a little bit in here after kind of taking off. My big problem with gold in more recent times is it has been kind of all over the place. With gold, I'm more interested in it at times like, like these when you're coming off of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like seven or eight to 10-year lows as opposed to just kind of meandering around in a range, even though it's a one or two-year low over here. So gold is just kind of all over the place, just having a hard time getting excited about gold stocks. And, and I, I, I've always been a gold bug too, and it's always been kind of to my detriment, always been a little nervous about that because in the back of my mind, I'm always a little excited about buying gold. So I have to be careful with that. When I was a kid, I wanted my dad to buy gold and I got him on a bunch of lists through a bunch of brokers, started bugging the hell out of him because it was my fault, gave out his number. But the reality is they're kind of, it's kind of all over the place. Now, we'll be a little bit more lenient with gold stocks, and I will trade the ones that are a little bit more wide and loose because the underlying commodity can sometimes make them a little bit more choppier because gold's very efficient to market, and that efficiency tends to make the gold stocks choppy. How about FLDM for William? All right, William, FLDM. Well... Longer term, I don't like this big gap, you know, but dude, that's a long time ago. Well, it was, and then before that, you had this gap here, obviously, back in 2015. Markets have really long memories. A lot of people held through that and still are holding that. Now, eventually, that does work its way through the system, but it's something that's in the back of my mind when I look at a stock like this. So let's zoom in a little bit. And it's just kind of, it did kind of, take off nicely, and then it did kind of accelerate higher. So let's see what happens when it sets up. But the fact that we're buying right into this big old gap, that would have me a little nervous, even though that gap's a long, long, long time ago. But let it set up first, and then we'll, we'll revisit it. Maybe put it in your momentum list, but obviously it's not set up now. You wouldn't want to buy that breakout just yet. NTLA. 
So I think if anything, walk away with the fact that markets have long, long memories. Well, this one's kind of all over the place. As you can see, a bit of electrocardiogram longer term. Let's zoom in a little bit. And let's see what's going on here. It's just really not set up at this juncture. I mean, it tried to take off. It came back in a little bit. And then you have a lot of, not a tremendous amount, but quite a bit of overhead supply to deal with. I think it looks okay as a stock that's bottoming out. But I think it's going to have um, some issues along the way. All right, any more? Well, let's see if my daughter's getting towed away. <laughs> All right. Well, while we're at impasse, I obviously want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I appreciate you coming to the shows. For those of you who have trouble getting here, if you're watching the recording, shoot me an email and we'll work through the issues. And that's something I'm, I'm very much interested in fixing, obviously. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And I guess I'll see all you guys and girls again next Thursday. Thank you so much.